Welcome to Insight. Today we're chatting with Julian Zugazagoeta, director of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. Julian has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Julian, for joining us today. And this is great. So you just came off, fresh off of a plane from Kansas City to Miami Beach, where uh, Art Basel Miami Beach, and we're going to talk about one of the great museum gems of the United States, the Nelson Atkins Museum. Talk about that museum and its place within the, the constellation of museums in the United States. Well, it's, it's, it's part of a generation of museums that were created at the turn of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. And many great cities uh, needed at that time an important museum. And we had two fabulous patrons, uh, after which the museum is named, Mr. Uh, Nelson and uh, William Rocket Nelson, who was also the founder of the Kansas City Star, the paper. But he was a civic leader and he, he came, he's a self-made man. And one of the, his passions is, is, was art and started thinking about the notion that the museum needed, the city needed a great museum. He even gave his land where his home used to be for the creation of the museum. So we sit in a, in a very historic spot that was a whole neighborhood developed in the 20s. And the interesting story about the creation of the Nelson is like many of this, it was both his will, but also there's another important donor, Mary Atkins, who was less prominent in civic life. She was a very discreet lady. And also her, upon her death, she had traveled Europe. She knew that she wanted to continue and bring to her community the kind of art she enjoyed when she was traveling. And so the interesting thing is that those two states are all of a sudden guarded by different trustees, but there's one trustee in common and saying, well, maybe instead of doing two museums or two different things, let's bring those two assets together and create the Nelson Atkins. And therefore, I think that was very auspicious. From the start, this institution has been a uh, recipient of that kind of thinking that bringing things together is better for the whole community rather than multiplying. And so it was neither Ms. Atkins nor Mr. Nelson saw the creation of their things because they were open many years after their passing. And we opened their doors in 1933 with a beautiful bowls out building, half of it only furbished to be a museum, knowing that we could grow on the other half over time. And with a collection that was already encyclopedic from the start with incredible Asian art, which is one of our land. Real depth, and, and, and very unusual at that time to have a collection of that depth. Correct, and it was luck also because the first director had one of his students from Harvard in China and started buying, uh, and there's just by, uh, at the time, a telex coming in requesting funds and the funds were sent. It was very agile world also of acquisitions and. And it was then really shaping what the city was going to become. And that museum grew through great leadership of amazing donors. And Kansas City is blessed with a lot of very good uh, civic leaders that have a passion for the arts, whether collectors or understanding that the mission that the museum does, both to be a place of rejoicement, a place of retreat, a place of learning and, and, and knowledge, they have supported it tremendously over the like almost 90 years that we have been in existence. There is a tendency, it seems, in Kansas City and places like Kansas City to think first of investing in strengthening community. And, and that is not seen as separate from the business interests of the leaders themselves. Correct. And I think that is also what was very attractive to me, to, to be in a circumstance, in a city that somehow we don't attract as much international tourism or national tourism, but it was a great place to be to see how you can really impact visitation, how you can really transform the museum from within to be a resource for everyone at different levels. And so that is uh, what really is happening today is that the museum becomes a platform, a place for encounters, a place where people get together, discover art together or by themselves, but they come on their own terms. And so that, that, that is fulfilling really the aspiration that I think the civic leaders that created all this had in mind. Now let's continue the exploration of the building itself and we'll, and we'll go into the, the collection mm -hmm. because you really have one of the greatly executed architectural projects in which mm -hmm. you take this phenomenal, very imposing, but somewhat severe building mm -hmm. and then you, you have an extension built 
uh, to that. Talk about that annex, the block app. As I mentioned earlier, the fact that the museum was conceived also with almost half empty, knowing that it would grow, and that was already visionary in, in, in the 30s. And so it allows to grow within that perimeter for many years. But uh, almost 20 years ago, the, the museum started to feel the need to really plan, plan a new campaign. And under the leadership of my predecessor, Mark Wilson, there was, and the board, there was a great moment to have a competition of various well-renowned architects. And many played with the symmetry, you know, from our Beaux-Arts building, creating a symmetrical uh, building or connecting them somehow. And so the image Moore, is, is of, a, of a very long rectangle with colonnaded uh, front correct. And, and sort of a very classical Beaux-Arts kind of um, roof line and very dark. The very know. temple, no? I mean, it, it, the austere right. temple-like facade of this is the institution of culture. And Stephen Hall, who won the competition, uh, twisted the, even the competition by proposing a building that almost from the surface doesn't touch the Beaux-Arts building. It's only underneath that there is a connection between the two. And it's called the Feather because his building is full of light and full of glass and the stone. So it, it is a relationship. He was really playing that relationship between the two buildings. And so the block building was open in 2007 and hard to believe that it's almost 10 years and we'll, next year we'll be celebrating the 10 years of this. And through the investment year. and the generous support of, of other community members as, as well as named. Exactly. It. In order to accomplish this sort of thing, it is really a whole community and the philanthropy at all levels that can contribute to this kind of transformation. That works so wonderfully together. You have a very modern, modernist concept. You have the very classical uh, concept. Mm -hmm. What a great place for your collection, which indeed is so deep. We talked about the Asian art collection, mm -hmm. but the, but you also have a collection of extraordinary dimension in so many different areas. Yes, and I think the institution has now, I mean, there's areas of collecting that continue to grow and, and, and you know, calibrate everything. So uh, the Chinese early on was one of the very important ones as Southeast Asian art. Uh, today, American art, we have a lot of uh, good acquisitions and a great collection of American art. The Native American collection is growing dramatically, and it's growing dramatically because we have great curator, great support, and great leadership there. And two collections that are rapidly also growing and making the Nelson Atkins a special destination is both the photography collection that thanks to Hallmark a corporate collection that came to us at the opening of the building in 2007. So Hallmark has a tradition uh, since the 50s of collecting photography and they gave us all the collection. Really the, the center heart of American photography is something that we are very strong. In. And the, another collection that is growing is the African collection. African art is really, really taking also. As a, every encyclopedic collection, we have strengths of course on European art and old masters. And we are more and more opening ourselves to contemporary art. And contemporary art had been um, in the will of Mr. Nelson. There was a clause that we could not acquire art by artists that were not dead for more than 30 years. So from his will and from the early collecting, the most uh, contemporary and at the same time, the one that was the most uh, recent and distant is a Van Gogh painting. So because Van Gogh died relatively early right. in, uh, in his age. And so that was one of the rare, at the time, contemporary pieces we had. And we have really encountered a lot of incredible uh, resonance in our community to have contemporary art, whether it's standalone in, in our contemporary galleries that are now part of the block building, or also dialogues that have been generating with uh, putting contemporary art in context of the classic galleries. Well, and, and you have always had this sensibility of, of placing art into dialogue with other art and with, with community. One of the things that I think is so wonderful about this move is that you are walking into an area of risk. Again, there should not be a static museum. Right. You know, museums are living entities. And I think there's different levels of engagement and different levels of risk that you can take and different levels of commitment also because I think as a cultural institutions, at one point also we can commit to deciding this versus this or saying this interpretation of today's world that this artist or this group of artists bring is something that as an institution we're interested. 
And making those commitments are also part of what a vital uh, institution is all about. Julian Zugazagoyta, thank you so much for sharing the work of the Nelson no, Atkins you. Museum, one of the great museums of the country. And thank you so much for your leadership and your insight. No, thank you for having me here. Thank you.